started? Hi everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, we've heard from some people who came in early that they've been quite good so far, so I hope it's all right for you. Um, my name's Sophie and this is Ralph. We're both at Fonza LGI at the moment. We've been given the task of talking to you about on-call in an OSCE situation. And as far as I've found out, I don't think you've got a specific OSCE for being on-call, but I guess it can come up at the end of um, an exam OSCE when they've got some questions to ask you, so we'll try and go through it today. Um, what we're going to cover is up here now. Uh, none of it's rocket science, we're not teaching you any new medicine. Being on call is quite sort of a simple topic to go through, so we'll do some examples. It's more thinking about how you might present your answers in an OSCE situation rather than learning new knowledge, so I hope it's okay. Um, hopefully we won't do the full hour, it, it should be a lot shorter than that. So we're going to talk about prioritising jobs, common things that come up when you're on call, um, how to approach poorly patients, and just being confident in answering when you're in the exam situation. So being on call, you've probably picked up if you're on the wards a lot and you probably are the keen group if you've turned up to the lecture. But just to go over it again, so it's usually um, outside normal working hours when everyone else has gone home and you'll be responsible for uh, a few wards worth of patients. Um, it's the jobs that come up that can't wait till the normal day team come back in. So it's usually urgent-ish things. And if they're not very urgent, then you can tell whoever's giving you the job to go away and they can do it later on. Um, so we're going to just pretend we're on call today, so uh, the imaginary situation is we're getting the handover from the F1 who's just done the on call, been given the bleep, um, and they're telling us that they've been really busy, um, they've got a few things to hand over to us. So just wanted to pick on some people to see if you've got any ideas for what makes a good handover, thinking about what we need to do beforehand to prepare and things like that. Uh, so, uh, the lady who just come in, have you got any ideas on what you need to think about when you're doing a handover? Like location, what you talk about? Yep. Yep. So that was, we need to get prioritising and thinking about the first things we're going to do when we're on call. Sorry, I think it's recording the <laughs> message, so I'll go over it to, into the microphone. Um, how about the location, man in the purple shirt here with glasses on? Yeah. Yeah, so a room off the ward, somewhere that's <coughs> quiet, you're going to be talking about confidential information, so where there's not loads of patients about. And also you need to both be, you know, start somewhere where that's what you're doing is the handover, not like also dealing with a patient whilst talking. Okay. When we think about patients to prioritise, it's, all, it's, it's usually a bit tricky to sort of come up with how to explain prioritising patients if you don't have examples, because something simple like a cannula you might think isn't important, but then you might find out it's for a patient who's got sepsis and they haven't got any access and we can't give them antibiotics. Or you might have a patient who's really sick and you might think that they're your highest priority, but actually they're palliative, the most senior person on the team has seen them an hour previously and there's nothing else you can do for their management. So it's all going on what patients you have at the time. So in our imaginary situation now, you've got your geeky F1 clipboard with your patients on ready to hand over. So we've got a few examples. So one lady's needing some fluids prescribing. We've got someone who needs a chest, uh, chest X-ray interpreting. We've got someone with a high news score. Can, can the lady in the pink hoodie in the middle, can you just explain to us what a news score is, if you know? Yeah, so that was it's based on the observation, so we're looking at things like heart rate, blood pressure, oxygen saturation. So someone with a high news score, and lastly chasing some blood. So I won't patronise you by getting someone to ask which one we'll probably go and see first. Obviously we don't have enough information to know for definite that that's the most important one, but a news score of high is pretty, a uh, news score of nine is pretty high, so we're going to see them first. So I think Ralph's going to talk to you about this patient. Yeah. So the first one, uh, the first patient that we're going to see is Ms. Adams, and she is, let's say, 30 years old. Um, and what you've found out at handover is that she's five days post-op. She had multiple fracture repairs. That's what she came to the hospital for. Uh, and the F1 that's handing over to you is saying she's visibly, visibly breathless. I'm a bit worried about her. Uh, and this is like a new thing for her. Earlier in the day, she was okay. You know, she was recovering from her operation. She was doing really well. She's previously fit and well. And now all of a sudden she's got a new score of nine. Now if you're handed over something like that, um, say a uh, girl in the green hoodie, sorry to be picking on you, uh, I'm just being rude and pointing at people. 
what's going through your mind when you're getting a handover like that? If somebody's saying, you know, there's somebody that's previously well, I mean, had a big operation, but is recovering, but all of a sudden, you know, is, is breathless and he's got a higher news score and was previously fine. Wh what do you think? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the first thing that's going through my mind is, yeah, I'm worried about this patient. And second of all, I'm wondering, you know, we're, we're talking about on call and getting handover and stuff is, why are you handing this patient over to me? <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, this is somebody that's obviously ill and this is all you're telling me. So an important lesson for when you're getting handover is to ask a lot of questions <coughs> because especially when you start off, you will be an, ex an, an, an inexperienced F1 and the person handing over to you will be inexperienced. So I, I remember my first phone call, uh, people were handing things over to me and I was just saying, uh, yeah, okay, I'll do it. Uh, okay, I'll do this as well. And you know, they were just telling me really sort of bare minimum amount of information, but because I didn't know any better, I had to say, uh, okay, I'll do it. You know, but it'd be so much easier if I asked, you know, like what have you guys already done? And um, what investigations are already done? Can you tell me a bit more about the background? Um, what kind of operation was this? And, um, you know, uh, have you already informed any of your seniors? You know, just to get a bit more of an idea of what's going on, because at the moment you're just kind of going into it blind. But anyways, sometimes these kinds of things happen, you know, not, usually we work nine to five, but often we have to stay a little later when something like this happens. But there are situations when, you know, you're going to hand over and a nurse comes up to you and says, oh, can you just see this patient? She's, you know, she's got a new score of nine and you're like, oh, I just want to go to hand over right now. And, you know, sometimes you find yourself in those situations where you just say, okay, I'm really sorry, I have to hand this over to you. And, you know, you have to be nice and say, yeah, it's fine. I, 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 can, I can have a look at her first things. Okay? So, anyways, let's come back to this patient. Um, what, what are the kinds of things that are, that are going through your mind in somebody that's post-op and is suddenly getting a bit, feeling a bit worse and <coughs> being breathless? Yeah, exactly. So P is the kind of brown door thing that you're thinking about. Are there any other sort of things that you need to rule out? Because obviously P is the number one answer, but that doesn't mean she can't have something else on top of a P or something else entirely altogether. Sorry? Sure. Am I? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Those are good answers. Okay. So, first things first. You're going to see this patient. What's the first thing that you do when you assess any patient? Exactly, A, B, C. It doesn't matter who you are, what you're doing, who you're seeing. If you're assessing a patient, especially you know, if you're asked in, a, uh, in your OSCEs, what's the first thing that you do? It doesn't matter, you do A, B, C. That's never a wrong answer. It's always the safe answer, okay? You basically want to know, is this patient dead? And if they're not dead, how close are they to death? And what can I do to prevent it from happening while I'm here right now? So, you know, you're checking, are they still breathing? Are they talking to me? Are they, you know, with it enough to sort of answer questions? Is their airway open? Are they breathing at a normal rate? Do they need any oxygen? Is there any sign of them being fluid depleted? Okay, so, you know, you're, you're going to, I forgot what her name is, Miss Adams or whatever. Um, uh, you're asking her, you know, are you all right? What's going on? And just her answering you is telling you so much about her. Just her being able to talk to you in full sentences, you know, that's already telling you, okay, she, she might be poorly, but at least for right now, she's, you know, she's not desperately poorly, okay? So you do your assessment, and maybe she's got uh, an oxygen uh, concentration of 90% or something, so you put on some oxygen, okay? But other than that, you can't really think of any acute emergency, emergency things to do right then and right there, because her heart rate is maybe a bit high, but her blood pressure is fine. She doesn't seem clinically dehydrated, okay? So you're not rushing to put up fluids or anything, but you've, you've got the oxygen, okay. You've stabilized the patient. You're happy that she's poorly, but not desperately poorly. What do you do next? How about somebody from the front row? Um, let's say we haven't got IV access yet. Yeah, that's definitely something that we can think about. But even before we do that, I guess, well, all we've done so far is ABC. Sure. Yeah, exactly. So we can take a better history. We can do a full clinical examination. Or, well, maybe if we're in a bit of a hurry, we can do a targeted examination if this is more of an emergency. Um, and we can just kind of look through the notes. 
what's happened today? Well, if we just look through the clinical notes, has anybody written a plan? Has anybody anticipated anything? Has anybody done any investigations recently that might be useful um, for assessing this patient now? Absolutely. So we'll get more information, and we do that by uh, doing an examination and getting a history. So the history is that this chest pain is set on an hour ago, and it's central and sharp, and it's making her feel really breathless. Okay? So um, we can already sort of think that probably this is something like a PE or an MI. In any case, whatever it is, we're probably going to need some help at some point from either our SHO or our registrar. So it's really important that you let somebody know. Um, and it's usually put, even if you're going to do other things, let them know early because that means they can manage their own time as well. Okay, so what can we do in the meantime? What are some sort of things, given our differential, what are some sort of investigations that, or, or other things that we might think about doing until somebody clever comes along? Yeah, exactly. So if we're thinking about, could this be an MI? An ECG would be a really good idea because it could rule out an MI quite quickly. And, you know, that m if the ECG is normal, then we think, well, it does sound more like a PE now, doesn't it? Okay. Um, any other things? An ABG. Absolutely, that's a, really, that's a really good idea, doing an ABG. And now we, we can come back, for example, the cannula seems like a good idea now. Even if we might not need to push massive amounts of fluids right now, even if it's just because we're heading for a CTPA maybe in the future. And, you know, a poor patient with no access, nobody's going to blame you for putting a cannula and everybody's going to be happy. Okay? No, those are all really good answers. So an ECG, an ABG, we can put a cannula in. Obviously, pain relief is really important for patients <coughs> that are poorly. You know, even if they're, um, even if it's not the thing that's going to save them, it's going to calm them down, it's going to calm you down, it's going to calm the nurses down, it's going to calm the team down, it's going to make everything a bit less hectic if the patient isn't sitting there clutching their chest and, oh God. Okay? And then we can, you know, we can talk with our seniors, do you want to get, do you want me to order a chest x-ray? Do you want me to do this, get a portable chest x-ray on the ward? Should we get a departmental, et cetera, et cetera. And it's also really important to let the nurses know they're the ones probably that called you in the first place often. When you're on call, you'll get a bleep and a nurse will say, oh, there's somebody with a new score of a million. Can you please come and see them? And it's really good to feed back to them. I've seen the patient. I think this is what's going on. This is what I've already done. This is how you can help me. Could you please get the ECG machine or could you get a bag of fluids or whatever and let them know what the plan is. Okay? So, all right, we'll move on to patient number two. Uh, this is Mr. Lemon. He's a, a 40-year-old gentleman. He's got a history of three days of cough, sputum, and fever, and his oxygen saturations are just starting to kind of slip off the normal range. And uh, the F1 comes to you and says, yeah, this guy, he's, uh, he's come to our ward today, and, um, well, we think he's probably, well, I'll let you tell me what you think he has. And uh, we're waiting for a chest x-ray. I've, I've ordered it at around 3 o'clock. They haven't done it yet. Could you please chase it up, Ralph? And I'll say, okay, what do you think is going on with them? Yeah, a chest infection or pneumonia. Uh, that <laughs> seems like the most likely thing. Now, if somebody hands you this over, what would be some good things to ask? We've talked about how important it is to ask questions when you're getting a handover, when you feel like you don't know the full story. Sorry. Uh, yeah, exactly. So it's really good to ask about, you know, is this guy somebody that's, you know, just a 40-year-old guy that just has a chest infection? Can happen. It comes to the hospital. Or is this somebody that's got, like, a massive history of, of repeated chest infections? Every month he comes in and he's on prophylactic antibiotics. And because, you know, that'll change sort of how you treat this patient potentially, you know, if he's got bugs that are already resistant to loads of things, you know, if this is somebody well known to the team, it'd be so much more useful if they hand that over to you rather than you having to find this out yourself. Okay? What's another good thing that you might ask? Sorry? Yeah. Yes, we'll come on to that. That's a very good question. You know, has somebody already given this a bit more thought, you know? So something that I've learned to ask uh, in one of, in within my first few handovers is what I found really important is what have you already done? You know, um, what do I still need to do? Because 
they might ask you just to chase up this chest x-ray, but it might leave you with a lot more drops than you actually anticipated because they haven't told you that they, they haven't taken any bloods yet. And to, you mentioned the curve score, which we'll get on to in a second. To calculate a curve score, you need blood results. So if they haven't taken any bloods, then we can't do that. Uh, have they taken any blood cultures? Have they sent away any sputum cultures? You know, so it's really good to ask, what have you already done? And do you need me to do any other things? It's not because, you know, we think that other people are not, you know, uh, trying to dodge their jobs or anything. It's just communication because often what will happen is usually they have done it, but they haven't documented it anywhere. And it's so annoying when people have done things and they haven't written it anywhere. And then you're thinking, well, have they already done it? Have they not done it? Do I still need to do it? And then you have to log on to the results server and you need to see is anything on orders. And sometimes things aren't on orders, even though they have been done. And then you're in the situation where it's really embarrassing and you go to the patient and you're like, oh, I'm really sorry, but somebody already taken bloods from you. And it makes you feel stupid because the patient thinks, well, you're the doctor, you should know what they've already done. And you know, it's, it's a bit of a silly situation. So always ask when you're getting a handover, what have you already done? What do you need me to do? Is it really just the chest x-ray? Because if it's likely a pneumonia, you can begin to anticipate all the other things that this patient may need. You know, Have they already been started on antibiotics, for example? And if not, which ones do you want me to start them on if they do have a pneumonia? Because like I said, we came to this example earlier, you know, has he got a past history? Has he got like COPD or something? Has he got a resistant bug? And in that case, is there an antibiotic that you guys know works really well for him? Because you know, then I'm not gonna start him on you know, the basic stuff. I start him on whatever you guys recommend. Okay, anyways, so we're just asked to chase the chest x-ray. Let's focus on that. Let's say this is his chest x-ray. Um, how about the gentleman in the red shirt in the middle? Sorry to pick on you. Um, just pretend, pretend you're present, presenting this x-ray to me in, uh, in, your, in an exam situation, if you will. <laughs> uh-huh, yeah, no, really well done, yeah. Uh-huh. Absolutely. See, that, that was really well done. And it's also really good that in the beginning you mentioned there, there are no demographics because that's always the thing that they want to pick you up on. That's the thing where like, ah, you forgot to mention that, you know, <laughs> that, you know, you, you forgot to check the person's name or the date this was taken on or whatever. But yeah, the obvious thing is there's something uh, in the right lung uh, that looks like consolidation <coughs> and it's, you know, with the history, consolidation pneumonia. Okay? So we've chased this chest x-ray. And now we start thinking about all those other things. Is, well, he's got pneumonia. Oh, crap, now I have to figure out whether they already, are already treating him for this or not. OK, so who mentioned the curb score? <laughs> What's the curb score? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, so um, we've, uh, yeah, we'll skip over that because we're just chasing the x-ray for now, aren't we? But yeah, the first thing, if we, w if we had to assess this patient is always obviously ABC, ABC, ABC. You know, if, if they have an infection, uh, is there any, might they have sepsis, might they need fluids? But yeah, so we talked about the curve score and you're absolutely right. It's confusion, urea, respiratory rate, blood pressure, and age. And it's basically, a, it's a risk stratification tool. And it shows you that people that have a, a low curb score, like a curb score of zero, have a low chance of dying in the next, I, I forgot what the time frame is. They have a low chance of dying from their illness. P 
people that have a CURB score of five, uh, four or five have something like an over 50% chance of dying from their pneumonia. So it's a risk stratification tool. So people with a CURB score of zero, you're usually happy to say, very low chance of something going wrong. I can send you home with antibiotics. Um, and anything higher than, I think, uh, a one, you admit to hospital and you say, actually, you have to stay in for treatment. <coughs> yeah? So, you know, we were talking about asking questions. So, you know, have they taken, have they taken blood so that we can check whether their urea is above seven or not? Um, have they sent any blood cultures, et cetera? Okay, so from this example, we just learn how important it is to ask questions, even if it seems like it's just a simple thing that was handed over. Usually people aren't mean. Usually people are very clear to you. But, you know, it's just to be aware. Okay, Sophie, would you like to be your next patient? So we found another celebrity lead um, inhabitant who's poorly. Uh, apparently, Scary Spice has had a cholecystectomy earlier today, and you've been uh, called by the nurse to say she needs some more fluids prescribing. Often the nurses will do that if um, a bag of fluids has run out because nobody will have told them whether we're wanting to carry it on or not. So sometimes the patients don't need it and sometimes they do. So um, I'll just, can people just try and shout out some things that you would go, and when you're looking at the patient, how do you know if they're dehydrated or not? Blood pressure, yeah. Heart rate, yeah. Cat refill, muc uh, cat refill mucous membranes, yeah. Uh, JVP, yeah. Urine output. output, very good. Yeah, chest crackles. Um, anything in the notes? Or in the OBS chart, oh, we said OBS chart, but anything else written down? Fluid balance chart, yeah. Sometimes you look in, they've got a fluid balance chart. Um, you'd be even luckier if it's been filled in completely accurately, but it gives you a good starting point. Other things like, have they been vomiting? Have they had really loose stools? You can ask them what they've been taking in orally and um, whether they're thirsty or not. So there's lots of things to think about. And you'll probably forget one or two during each assessment, but at least you've got a lot of things to choose from. So, um, Ralph was talking about documenting in the notes before, but even with things like fluids, it's good to write down your assessment and how you come to the conclusion that you have. Because then if you're wrong, somebody will say in the morning and they'll stop it, or at least people will understand your thinking behind starting the fluids. Um, can the guy on the end of this road, do you mind? giving us a, an OSCE answer for what the difference between uh, a fluid challenge and maintenance fluids are, if you know. Yeah, so the fluid challenge is for people who are at that time um, cardiovascularly sort of a bit unstable, low blood pressure, tachycardic versus maintenance fluids might be for someone like Scary Spice who's had an operation, isn't taking anything orally, and you're just tidying them over until they start eating again, um, uh, eating and drinking again. Um, when we were at medical school, people were always talking to us about crystalloids versus colloids, and each person that you talked to would tell us something a little bit different, I always thought. Um, in practice, as an F1, 90% of the time I'm prescribing a crystalloid, and Hartman's versus saline tends to be determined by whether the, the ward stops Hartman's or not. <laughs> um, so well, Hartman's is really good if they use an either or uh, fine, whereas saline maybe is better if they're a bit hypokalemic or something like that. I would usually um, try and do something like Volplex or a colloid if they are having a fluid challenge, especially if they're a dermatist or anything like that, third space in the fluids, then their colloid is good. And I'm sure you've heard about when you need to be a bit more cautious with giving fluids. So patients that are really edematous anywhere or who have a history of heart failure, then you'd be being really cautious. And if you're at all worried, then just get some advice from a senior. So I think you've got another lecture like this on paperwork and everything. But this is just um, one of the fluids charts we've got here and how you'd fill that out. So um, for maintenance fluids where they're not getting any fluids orally, then you'd go for an eight hourly bag and you just write up like that, this, obviously it's fine, it's fine. Okay, and our last patient for now is Richard Whiteley, who <laughs> isn't very well at the moment in real life, but um, here he's currently stable, been in for four days, and you've had a look through his notes, and his use and ease are getting a little bit worse each day, and you've been asked to chase his blood. So Ralph's already gone through this, just getting as much information as he can. And you get his bloods back, and they're a bit like this. Can anyone say which ones they're a bit more worried about? 
the potassium, yeah, is a little bit on the high side. <coughs> and the creatinine, yeah. And um, when you're looking at a creatinine, what else would be helpful to know? Yeah, baseline. And uh, I was just doing a night shift recently where a registrar was talking to me about this. I thought if people's creatinines were normally in the normal range and became high, then I would always treat them as if they had an acute kidney injury. He said it was actually a bit better to look at what the baseline is and work out what 30% of that is. And if it goes up by 30%, then start treating it as an acute kidney injury. But he said he'd only learned that a few weeks before as well, so I don't think that's uh, completely essential knowledge. Um, and so um, if you've got a patient who has got an acute kidney injury, do you know how to categorize um, the likely causes? Who can shout it out? Yeah, pre-renal, renal, or post-renal. So to be looking at what you thought the cause was, you'd be doing a fluids assessment like we did on Scary Spies. You'd maybe get them to do a bladder scan, or if they've already got a catheter in, look and see if it's been draining. Just simple things like that. Nobody's going to be asking you to diagnose their kidney problems um, if it's a renal cause. Um, and you, usually it's going to be due to dehydration. So what's our management strategy? Fluids. And anything else simple you can do there is the F1. It's usually looking at the drug chart seeing if there's any easy medications you can hold the next day. Have you seen them um, on the drug charts? If you just want them to miss out the next dose, you can put a six in it. That means, like the doctor said, don't give it tomorrow or whatever. And then the day team can um, see whether they want to carry that on or not. So these are just some medications that I've stolen off the internet that are good to stop, but I'm sure you've already heard of them. So it's the NSAIDs. You'll be thinking about some of the um, blood pressure meds and sometimes the antibiotics. Um, this slide was more of an example to say, uh, when you're in F1, if you've forgotten something, like I know you probably, by the time you're doing finals, you'll be hot on hypokalemia and everything like that. When you get to an F1, sometimes you've got a little bit rusty on those. Um, but the internet guidelines here are super good. And they're worth looking up if you're on the wards and you're bored and there's nothing to do because the ward on's finished and everyone's gone for coffee without you. But, and then it's worth a bit of revision looking at that because they're quite good. I think um, the Leeds ones for potassium of 5.9 actually say that you only need dietary modifications and there's a, a page you can print out with all the foods that you should get the patient to miss out. I think it's like citrus fruits and coffees and bananas and stuff. Um, but that's always good. And obviously, even if the guidelines say that, if it's someone who's been really hyperkalemic before and it's being refractory, then maybe you'd treat it more as a moderate hyperkalemia than a mild. So Ralph's going to talk to you about crashes now. <laughs> Has anyone gone to a crash call? Well, there are medical students. Has anyone been to like a crash call situation? Yeah? What, what did you think about it when you went? Chaotic, isn't it? Yeah. It's still chaotic as an F1 as, as well. It doesn't really change. <laughs> so when you're on call, uh, you, it depends on which team you're on. Uh, on a lot of teams, especially if you're doing a night shift, you may end up holding the crash bleep. And the crash bleep is basically just a regular bleep that people can bleep you on. But also, um, it has the extra function of serving as like an emergency alarm thing. So if somebody somewhere in the hospital pulls the emergency buzzer and puts out a crash call, then the crash, the crash bleep will inform you. A person will start talking through it, tell you where the crash call is. And you are obligated to then go to it and pretty much drop everything you're doing and go to the crash call. Sophie and I, when we're during this lecture, we had a debate about how you get to the crash call. And I said, you always walk to the crash call because you don't want to be out of breath when you get there. And Sophie says, no, I always run to crash calls. <laughs> I still, I tend to walk quickly. <laughs> um, but yeah, OK. So what we're saying is, um, oh yeah, usually, usually when, you, when you go to a crash call, you're not the first one. There's somebody already there, and you're, you know, you're just kind of slotting in and trying to help out where you can usually not the first one, so don't, don't, don't worry about it. Um, but when you are the first one, to be honest, sometimes that's even easier than being the second one, because all you have to do is A, B, C, okay? And that's sometimes easier than trying to figure out the more complicated things to do, because if you find a patient that's unresponsive, and it's not breathing, and doesn't have a pulse, you just do CPR, okay? And CPR, all you need is two hands, and that's it, okay? So that's sometimes the easiest bit. When you're in F1, usually, this is the ALS algorithm for, um, the, uh, yes, the ALS algorithm. You usually only 
have to worry about these first couple of boxes here, you know? By the time you get to the point where you're assessing a rhythm or thinking about whether to give adrenaline or not, there'll be a registrar or somebody else there helping you out. But obviously for, for exam situations, it's, it's good to know the whole algorithm because it's something easy to ask you about, you know? Um, since this is about like be a lecture about being on call, I found that if you do go to a crash call, like we said, it is sort of a chaotic, confusing situation. And, you know, some, sometimes when you show up, people will look at you and, you know, they'll try to squint at your badge to see sort of what role you are, are you, you a registrar, are you, you know? And sometimes people, you know, they'll be too embarrassed to ask and they'll just assume that, yeah, maybe this guy's a registrar, you know, especially if you're like a grad student or something or you've done something else and you look a bit more mature, then people will just assume, okay, he's leading the crash call without actually ever confirming it with you, you know? So I'm really sort of not at all w afraid to say, hi guys, I'm Ralph, I'm the F1, how can I help? Because that immediately tells them, you know, I'm not going to be leading this, how can I help you? What, you know, realistically can I do for you? I can, I can help you do the CPR, I can try to put a cannula in or do an ABG, but, you know, it, I won't be leading the call, you know. <laughs> That'll be up to somebody else. Okay, but actually, they are chaotic, but SNF1 is not that scary be going to a crash call, so you don't have to be afraid of that. Okay, so really, that brings us to the end of this lecture. Um, I know that a lecture about being on call is probably not the first thing on your mind now that you're preparing for finals, but I, we hope to sort of integrate a few uh, maybe useful questions for you along the way. And just the fact, I think, that you guys have shown up after having a day at the hospital uh, means that you're, I'm sure, are the guys that pass without any problems because you're the kinds of people that, you know, have enough enthusiasm to spend the extra time and come to a boring lecture after spending a day at the library or the hospital or wherever. So good luck, I'm sure you'll do fine. You're the kinds of people that always do fine and pass without any problems, okay? Thank you. Oh, and do you have any questions about anything? About, you know, being on call, being in a fun, uh, about... Yeah, well, I was going to say, well, uh, if anyone's going to the Yorkshire Deanery, then which jobs have we done? I've done the orthopedic one and I'm just doing the anesthetics on them and they've both been really good. And I, I've done respiratory medicine and pediatrics, so if, if you've got any questions about that, obviously after the lecture, happy to answer anything. And we'd be super grateful if you could fill in the feedback. So oh, yes. Not, <laughs> not Thank you. Thanks.